So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast and Bible Study with uh, uh, First Presbyterian Church of Bradenton. You can find us here Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. Uh, you can get to us by going to our uh, website, bradenton.church slash Zoom, and finding the link for Breakfast and Bible Study. So we're going to start a, a series on uh, the minor prophets, but before we, we talk about prophets, minor, major, or anything in the Old Testament, um, we kind of need to dip brief, briefly into the well and, and drink of geography and history for a second. So where is the Levant, if, you, if you've even heard of it? Where, where is that? What's it mean to you? Nothing. Okay. Um, it's basically the land around the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, I, I know you've heard of ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Right. Um, you might, especially when it was first emerging, you might have heard it referred to as ISIL, which is the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Yes. Um, in English, that's probably actually a better name, but you know how we are the one that stuck, the one that stuck. So I'm going to share a map on the screen here and take a quick look at this. So the Levant is not, you know, well defined. You know, it, it's yes, we know it's an area generally looks like this. It's between uh, Turkey and, and Egypt. Um, how far away it goes from the, uh, from the coast is, you know, sort of open to interpretation. Uh, what about Cyprus? Is Cyprus actually part of the Levant? Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, now, this map I like a little better, but it didn't have any of the contemporary names on it. So you can see, you know, dark red, absolutely, definitely the Levant. Lighter red, it probably we would call it the Levant. You get out towards the edge where it's a little orangish. Maybe that's the Levant, maybe not. But, you know, it, this, is, this is where we're talking about in general. And now to put it in context for us, this is not exactly the Levant, but this is pretty close to the, what we would call the Levant, but with... Uh, biblical place names in it for us. So we see the kingdom of Aram, Damascus, which we talked a couple of weeks ago uh, about the fact that that's basically Syria. Uh, kingdom of Ammon, where we, uh, we hear about the Ammonites, the Moabites below them, the Edomites south of that. Uh, we see the Philistines and the Phoenicians. Now, we also see the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Um, what, what's that about? What, what's the difference between Israel and Judah? Any ideas? Why do we talk about there being two kingdoms? I don't know. The river goes through it. <laughs> um, until, well, for, for a while, originally, um, it was one kingdom. It was all Israel. And each of the 12 tribes had an area that they were assigned uh, back in the, the time when they, they moved into this part of the world. Um, Joshua, uh, based on what God had told him, assigned different tribes to different regions. Um, so we started out originally with that and we went through the times of, um, of the judges and then we got into the time of kings and through the period where Saul ruled and David and Solomon, it was all one kingdom. After Solomon died, uh, there was a lot of question about uh, who was going to take over after that. I mean, there were there were assassinations for people that tried to uh, you know tried to take over. It, it was a real mess, and for a number of reasons, which we could practically do a class on all by themselves, um, the the two it divided up into two kingdoms. Um, you may, if you were to Google this, you could look for uh, the term United Monarchy, and that would talk to you about Saul, David, and Solomon in the time that they were together. Um, but after that, they divided up. Now, the northern kingdom called Israel was most of the tribes. It was Asher, Dan, Ephraim, uh, Gad, Issachar, Manasseh, Nathali, Reuben, Simeon, and Zebulon. And the southern kingdom was really only two. It was Judah and Benjamin. Uh, it picked up the name Judah because Judah was the predominant tribe in that area. Um, now, from this time forward, and this is about 730 BC, uh, from this time forward, 
Israel has never been a united country since then. Um, you know, we, we've got a country that we call Israel now. It does not cover all of the terri that, territory that ancient Israel did. Uh, when is it going to uh, be united again? There's all sorts of stuff we can talk about in, in those terms. So now we've got, it, got that picture in our minds. Um, who are the minor prophets? Probably help a little bit to know who the major prophets are. And this really doesn't have anything to do with um, how significant their books are, how significant their message was. It's really just about length. Now, the major prophets, um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and Daniel, those books are pretty long. Uh, there's a lot of, of verbal content there. So the other 12 uh, are called the minor prophets. It's the last 12 books in the Old Testament. And they're, in, in their own ways, individually, their message is just as significant as the message from any of the others. We just don't hear about them very much because, you know, Isaiah covered a lot of territory uh, verbally. Um, he covered a lot of history. He covered a lot of different things. And since he spoke so much about the Messiah, he's the, the prophet that's most often, ref, often referenced in the New Testament. And interestingly enough, that was a question on Jeopardy last night. Um, <laughs> which, which of the Old Testament prophets was, is quoted the most in the New Testament? Um, I don't remember who asked, got the question, but he missed it. So shame on him. Um, so the, the, the major prophets are really just longer books. And since they cover more of this ground verbally, uh, you're more likely to have heard of them by name. Um, okay, now let's see here. Let me share once more uh, the screen. And this is just a quick rundown of when each of the prophets, uh, the minor prophets were in play. Now you'll notice that with these three columns, some of the prophets were sent specifically to talk to foreign nations. Jonah, we know specifically, um, he was sent to Nineveh. Uh, that's pretty much what his whole story is about. Um, Nahum was also uh, sent off to foreign lands as was Obadiah. And only two of the prophets, including Hosea, who we're gonna talk about today, um, and Amos were really targeted at Israel. Um, it's not that Judah didn't do anything wrong, because as you can see, uh, Judah was the target of most of the prophets, uh, old or rather ma major and minor, um, as we went on. So these prophets run from a period of about 750. Actually, Hosea is older than that, 715. Uh, now I just did it backwards. That always bothers me with BC. I uh, you know, as the number gets smaller, it gets nearer rather than going further right. back. So um, Isaiah, Jonah, Amos were all in the 750, 760 uh, BC era. And we start yeah. getting closer and closer uh, until we get up to Malachi, uh, who is the last of the books in the Bible. And when Malachi ends, there's a 400 year gap between the end of Malachi and the New Testament. Um, so but that's just generally how they're laid out. Um, Hosea probably has the oddest opening of any book in the Bible. Um, verse one is fairly standard introductory stuff. And verse two more or less says, God said, go marry yourself a hooker. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Uh, no, seriously, that, that's what it said. So let's take a look at Hosea. Uh, chapter 1, verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, and that's funny, I don't have my, don't have my Bible open here, so. We'll see it's not easy. Yeah. So if somebody's got that and would like to read verse, verse 1 for us to start off with. Okay. I think we got it here. The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Ben, in the days of Urza, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. Okay, so okay. 
confusing as it may be with the names and stuff, that that's a fairly standard way of of opening. You know, who, who's writing the book? Who are they talking about? When was it written? It gives you some background on that sort of stuff. Um, so now let's read verses two and three also. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea and the Lord of Hosea. Go, take on, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the Lord hath committed great whoredom departing from the Lord. The land. Uh, oh, okay, sorry. So, uh, isn't isn't that an odd thing for it to say? Yes. Um, go out and, and take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. Um, well, and then he said, so he, meaning Hosea, uh, went and took Gomer, son of Di Diblam, uh, which conceived and bore him a son. So, okay, Hosea did just what he was told. Why? Why are we doing this? Why are we talking about this? What What do you think the, the link may be to some sort of biblical message? Well, it looks like maybe when they talk about the cordom and, and that, maybe, maybe the message is kind of directed to sinners. I mean, more than anything, I'm not sure. Uh, absolutely. You're, you're headed the right direction there. It's... Uh, this whole book is basically a comparison of marriage to the relationship with God. Now, you know, we even hear that in the New Testament. We talk about the church being the bride of Christ. Yeah. Um, the relationship between uh, a husband and wife should be the same as a relationship in, in some way, should be the same as a relationship between uh, God and, and his people. Uh, they should be faithful to one another. Uh, they shouldn't stray. Uh there's all sorts of comparisons that we can make here. And Israel and, and Judah both, of course, um, had not done this. They uh, had, had gone off and, and separated and worshiped false gods. They were intermarrying when they weren't supposed to. Uh, they were not keeping the purity of the, of the uh, marriage bed, so to speak, by going out and marrying into these other tribes. And it just... Uh, you know, is, is not the way God wanted the relationship to be. So we read through this whole first chapter, um, and, and we see that uh, Israel hasn't really been, hasn't, hasn't been very, God hasn't been very happy with Israel. Uh, interestingly, here in verse 4, um, then the Lord said to Hosea, uh, speaking of, of the son that he was born, uh, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I'll put an end to the kingdom of Israel. Uh, Jezreel means God scatters. Uh, so in this context, um, God is going to scatter the kingdom of Israel. And while we won't go in necessarily all the details, uh, Israel is broken up and scattered. It's invaded. Uh, outsiders come in and uh, it says in verse 5, he will break Israel's bow, uh, meaning he's going to break Israel's military might. Um, so Israel specifically, because that's who Hosea, Hosea was speaking to, um, gets divided. Um, verse 6, it says, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call her uh, Lo Ruamaha, and that means in, in Hebrew, that means not loved. Uh, and he says, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel. Uh, you know, what a, what a horrible name for a child. And uh, in verse 8, uh, uh, verse 8 and 9, uh, they have another son. And uh, he's told to name him Lo-Ami, which means not my people. Um and, and God then says, for you are not my people and I am not your God. Well, it really sounds like God is just dumping them out the car door while he's driving down the road and is going to have nothing more to do with them. Uh, that does not sound like the relationship we anticipate uh, God having with his people. But God's pretty upset at this point um, uh, for, for Israel's actions. And we're not going to get into the details, but if you read through chapter 2, um, 
it, it talks about how, how Israel is punished, um, the things that uh, are going to happen to them, but it does it again in the context of, of a marriage. Um, it, it says things like, rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my wife and I'm not her husband. Uh, let her remove the adulterous look from her face. Um, it talks about the things that are going to be done. And it, it, it's, it's pretty rough. I mean, Israel's obviously taking it pretty hard here. And when we get to chapter three, which is another fairly short chapter, only five verses, um, God tells Hosea to reconcile with his wife. And again, just continuing with this, uh, this analogy, um, God's saying that he's going to reconcile with, with Israel at this point. Um, in the beginning of chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, the Lord said to me, Hosea, uh, go show love to your wife again, even though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes, um, you know, offerings given up to these other gods. So God is telling Hosea, take your wife back, love her, it's okay. Everything will be all right. No matter what she's done, it's okay. You can reconcile with her. Now, this is not the way that um, a strayed wife would normally have been treated in these times. Normally, that would be, uh, you know, the cause for divorce. She'd be dismissed, uh, cast aside. The husband would go on with his life, and she's just stuck out of luck. Um, but God is saying to Hosea, you're not going to do that. We're going, to res we're going to save this marriage. We're going to resolve these problems, which, of course, is, again, his analogy to what's going to happen with God and Israel. So you think this is a real husband, wife, and children? It's not just a story of Israel? You know, they're still arguing about that in academia. Um, I mean, why I would the Lord tell them to do all of this? And they followed and did it. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, you know, I, I can go either way, but I think for me personally, I think that it probably was a, a real husband, wife, and family. And the reason being, I think it would have given Hosea a better feel for how God felt at being abandoned by having himself abandoned and then for him to see how joyful God could be when they were able to reconcile. That's not that Hosea wouldn't have believed God saying that he was upset about this, but if you're going to tell a story, it helps for you to really feel that story, to be involved in it and understand it. Um, you know, actors call that method acting. They, they get into the character so much. Right. It's, it's not them anymore. Um, so I think this is God's way of showing Hosea you know, this is serious. I, my, my feelings are really hurt here. And I want you to convey this message to these people in Israel. I want you to talk to them and I want them to see the hurt on your face and be able to associate that with the hurt that's in my heart. Now, could it just be an analogy? Yeah, absolutely. It could be pure metaphor. There's a lot of that in the Bible. Um, but I think here, I, I think there's a real good chance that, uh, um, that, it's, that it's the real deal. I'm with Pat. I can't possibly imagine going through that, knowing what you're going to go through just because right. even God told you so. Yeah. And what did he do with it? I mean, it's the story doesn't say anything about what he did with it. Um, that's true. Um, although as we move through, if we get, if we were to read all the way through and get down to the end of chapter 14, um, we okay. see that there is reconciliation. Uh, it's not probably as much detail as we'd like, but I guess it helps to keep in mind this isn't really a story about Hosea. It's a story about God and Israel. So I think we see the reconciliation coming and need to assume that this is what happened with Hosea as well. <clears throat> okay, I think that helps me a little bit with this. Yeah, me too. Okay. Um, and I would also say, as, as uncomfortable as it can be, uh, keep in mind that serving God can be pretty tough sometimes. 
Um, He puts people through things um, that they would not really want to go through. And it's not necessarily because they did anything. He's just setting them up to realize how much they need him. Um, It's it's a, a, a tough way to live sometimes. You know, I certainly wouldn't have wanted to go through what Jonah went through, but Jonah needed to be taught a lesson. And, you know, that's, that's how God chose to do it. But Jonah was actually taught that lesson because what he did was not what God told him to do. That, that's very true, um, which is the lesson that Israel should be learning. They're not doing what God's telling them to do. Um, but you're right. It, it does seem to be a little harsh on Hosea uh, for him to have to go through that when he had been obedient to God. Um, I think the fact that Hosea is having God speak through him um, probably indicates that Hosea had a tight enough relationship with God that he knew God's presence was there all the time. He was always part of Hosea's life, and Hosea knew even if he wasn't really feeling the love at the moment, you know, he was still there. It's the same thing, uh, if you really want to stretch the analogy, it's the same thing that Christ went through. Christ did absolutely nothing to deserve the punishment that he got, but I think what got him through it was knowing that God was always there. Um, He was going to be with him. There might be a separation, you know, at at the time of the cross Cross. and and his death, but he knows that God's still going to be with him. I, I don't see how anyone could have dealt with that. Uh, without having a really firm feeling that that's the way it was going to go. So if we, if we were to continue on, and I'm, I'm not going to read through it, um, but if we continued on through chapters 4 through 14, uh, the rest of this book covers four basic topics in, in more detail. Um, it, Israel's unfaithfulness, it, it outlines the things that Israel have done uh, to, to separate themselves from God. Um, it, it talks about Israel's punishment as the second thing. Uh, it talks about Israel being invaded and Israel being broken up um, and scattered. Uh, there's a reminder that God is always faithful, no matter what it seems like at the moment. God never breaks his, his uh, bond with us. It never breaks his faith with us. And the last thing it shows is that even with an adulterous, idolatrous nation like Israel, ultimately they're going to repent and the restoration is going to come about and and God will take care of them. They'll be back again. Now, th- this is a, an, an interesting place to talk about a, a particular word. And so I almost feel like this would be a good topic for um, uh, Dino and, and Larry to catch on, uh, on their show. Um, the word scattered. If you remember, I said that the word, the name Jezreel means God scatters. And how many times in the Bible can you think of God scattering things or people? There's actually an awful lot of them, more than, more than I even realized when I started. What are some instances of God scattering that come to mind? Well, the flood for one thing. Okay. Uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, yes, scattered their family, ran them out of, of yep. uh, Eden, absolutely. Um, what about the uh, the Tower of Babel? Oh, yes. God yeah. specifically scattered people and separated them uh, so they, they needed to come back to him. Um, there's a number of places uh, in numbers God calls, or Moses calls on God to scatter their enemies and uh, in, in 1 Samuel, Saul's army attacks uh, an Ammonite camp, and uh, it says that they were so scattered at the, by the time they were done, there were no two of them left together. Um, in Chronicles, God calls for uh, Egypt to be scattered uh, and then to come back together under one leader, and there's just all sorts of places where this, uh, where this uh, is used as an analogy, and it's rarely a good thing. Now, scattering is generally a bad thing. Uh, you, it, it's, it, it just doesn't work out for you very well. But there's another way to look at it. And if we go all the way to the end of chapter 14 in Hosea, um, we see 
actually, let me let me scroll down there myself. Um, we see the use of Jezreel again in a in a little different way. Um, now, my Bible's not scrolling for me well here, but uh, somewhere towards the very end of chapter 14, um, it talks about uh, Jezreel again, only in this sense, it's the context is uh, scattering as in scattering seeds and planting and regrowing and coming back together. There are a couple of places where scatter is used in that sense uh, that, that it's a good thing. And it's always God doing the scattering, God doing the planting, God doing the, the growing uh, for, for the harvest. And I think it's interesting to recognize that even <clears throat> something that we generally consider to be, <coughs> excuse me, um, consider to be a bad thing, the scattering, uh, can, can be turned to the positive by God. Um, you can't, uh, you can't plant seeds by just dumping one big pile in the middle of your garden. You need to spread it out. You need to scatter it. Um, we, you know, we've got the parable in the New Testament of the, of the seeds. Uh, you know, some are scattered on a, uh, on a path and get trodden on, some on uh, fertile ground, some on unfertile ground, some amongst the weeds. Um, but that scattering needs to take place uh, so that you've got every opportunity to see the different faces of God, the different messages that are coming to him. So um, with that, we're going we're gonna to say we're done with Hosea. Um, and we're going to look at two books next week, which are both uh, fairly short. And we won't have to go through the introductory phase again. Um, we're going to look at Joel and Amos. And if we, if we were to look back at the, uh, uh, at our, who, who did what to whom chart of the, uh, the minor prophets. Amos is probably one of the earliest. He uh, worked for probably 13 years or so between 750, uh, 763 and 750 BC. And Joel was, uh, was later. He was about a century later in the, in the uh, we don't really know for sure exactly when he was, but somewhere uh, in the uh, 600 to 500 uh, BC. Um, Amos was the other prophet that was directed specifically at Israel. Uh, Joel was the first prophet we're going to talk about that was, uh, that was targeted directly at Judah. So um, I am going to send to you a, a, just a Word document that's got these maps in them. So if you yes. want to take a look at them, um, and use them. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we'll send those out to... Uh, uh, the folks that weren't with us today as well with quick explanation of, of what we what we talked about. So what do you think? Any questions, any uh, any thoughts to share on Hosea? Well, I didn't read Hosea. I read uh, Isaiah. So I have to now go back and read Hosea. So uh, okay. to, to catch up with the whole 14 chapters. Now, you know, I would... I would never suggest that anybody just just skim a book, um, but if you read carefully the first three chapters, yeah. you don't necessarily need every detail that's in the next uh, the next eleven. Um, if you're interested, certainly you know d dig into it. You know, and if you got questions, please feel free. Um, then focus a little more on chapter fourteen as you get to it, which starts to get into um, Israel's repentance and the and the restoration. I think you'll. Uh, I think your time will be well spent if you if you take a look yeah. at it that way. Okay, I will. And then all of Amos and Joel for next week. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Nancy, did you have something? Do you think using BibleGateway.com and looking at different versions of the Bible would be make it easier to understand the concepts behind these? Uh, sometimes I I think so. Um, thanks for, for mentioning the name, but that's probably my favorite Bible website of, of all is BibleGateway.com. Um, you can look up individual verses or entire books. You can pick the King James and then switch over to the New International Version. Um, it doesn't have an option to let you look at them side by side, but you can toggle between them pretty quickly. Um, and that's a, 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 good, a good 
tool to use. I'm uh, using the uh, King James Bible online and I can put both new and uh, the King James side by side. Oh, well, good, oh. good. But now, is that the new, do you mean the NIV or the new King James? Uh, the NIV and uh, the new, um, where is it? Parallel view. Oh, okay. Yeah, I find that I find that really useful. There's other sites that I go to um, that let you do that. What was what was that one, Pat? Um, KingJamesBibleOnline.org. Okay, I will have to take a look at that. Always always happy to add another uh, arrow to my quiver here of these uh, study tools. Well, we had we had two of them up on here, but unfortunately, one side was in Greek. <laughs> but we <laughs> no, I just I just got it. I have to do it every it. time when you when you flip to another name, then I've got to go and do it all again. Uh, okay. All right. Well, you know, I I neglected to pray for us as we started, so let me uh, oh, I'll pray yeah. extra earnestly as we close up here for the for the day. Mm -hmm. uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this chance to get together. Uh, even though we're few today, uh, we know that uh, you told us that you'll be there with us in a special way when we gather uh, in your name. So we know that you are here today. Uh, and we pray that uh, there was some impact uh, from your words uh, in the Bible here uh, in Hosea that, uh, that led us to some new ways of thinking. Um, we pray that we will uh, find ways to keep our relationship with you uh, to be as pure as we like to keep our marital relationships, uh, that we would, that we don't stray from you, uh, and know that you will be faithful to us, uh, no matter what the circumstances. So we pray that you'll go with us today, and, and as we uh, as we move through the week and get ready to take a look at Joel and Amos, uh, we pray that you'll be with us individually as we read those uh, read those verses and uh, and see where you might be taking us when we study this next week. In your son's name, Father. Amen. Amen. Amen.